Writing is a solitary profession. Yes, you deal with publishers and editors and graphic designers, booksellers and PR people, fans and readers. But in the end, it's really just you and your keyboard, or pen and paper, or pencil and notebook, or ox blood and papyrus, whatever floats your creative boats. You sit there in front of your screen and create something from nothing. Possibly you invent new worlds or languages or, and this is pretty much universal to all writers, you invent entirely new people. You can feel like a god, but you're a god alone. Maybe you're lonely, maybe not. It depends. Even if you're not lonely, it is nice to connect with other writers that get it, that truly understand the enormity of what you are attempting to do. Again, creating something from nothing. In my life, I have a few writers that I know I can turn to that will be 100% real with me. I hope to eventually have them on as guests of this podcast. Someday. Baby steps right now. And that's what this profession is really all about. Baby steps. You can't rush the process because so much of it is out of your control. And if you are lucky enough to maybe have Hollywood come knocking, then you quickly learn just how little control you have. I have a few writer friends that have learned that lesson or are in the middle of learning that lesson. It's neither a good lesson nor a bad lesson, just a lesson. Today we look back at an interview I had with Nathan Ballingrud. He's had a lot happen since this interview was first released a couple years ago. I am sure Nathan has learned some lessons since this interview. One day, maybe he'll come on and let us know. But for today, we step back to a simpler time. A time where two writers connected and got to chat about something we both absolutely love. Writing. And that's the key. No matter how alone we may be or how lonely we get as creatives, we keep on keeping on because we love to write. So, come along and join me on this mad journey. I promise you won't feel lonely after listening. Welcome to Writing in Suburbia with Jake Bible. Hey y'all, just wanted to let you know that I have more than this podcast going on. I'm also publishing a weekly newsletter, as well as releasing chapters of novels, the original podcast recording of Dead Mech, the Friday Night Drabble Party, and so much more. Where is all this greatness? Go to jakebible.substack.com. That's jakebible.substack.com. You can subscribe for free and get plenty of cool stuff weekly. Or become a paid subscriber and get the first releases of novels and audiobooks before they go on sale. Full access to the Dead Mech podcast immediately instead of weekly installments. Access to the full archive and exclusive threads and discussions. Plus a ton of cool stuff I haven't even thought up yet. Head over to jakebible.substack.com and subscribe now. Again, welcome to Writing in Suburbia with Jake Bible. What is this podcast? It's a place where I talk about my career as a professional writer, my fiction, my dreams, my life and family, host other authors, eventually. Try out some new things and just be real for a moment. I promise not to get preachy, to always be kind, and to be 100% honest without hurting anyone. So, sit back and relax and prepare to be entertained. But before we get into the meat of the episode, how about some quick Jake Bible Fiction news? Welcome once again to JBF News. As you may have realized, the podcast is now live. That's news in of itself, trust me. Be sure to share with friends, family, colleagues, and random people on the street. Socially distance when you share. That means standing across the street from someone and shouting at them at the top of your lungs with a mask on. 
totally normal. Still waiting on the edits for Quantum Chaos, the sixth rogue galactic bounty hunter novel. I'll keep you all posted as to when that drops. I am busy working on the seventh rogue book, so that's good. Let's see, what else? Still narrating, producing audiobooks. If you want to hear my dulcet tones, then check out Trader by Mark Eller. It's free right now on Google Play. It's also available on Audible. Speaking of narrating, be sure to check out the re-release of the original Dead Mech podcast. Subscribe to this podcast feed in your favorite podcast app, and you'll get the first episode delivered right to your ears in just a few days. Get on that if you haven't. The subscribing. Don't want to wait to listen? You can always purchase the audiobook or get the ebook of Dead Mech for free. Check out the show notes on jakebible.substack.com for links. And I think that's it for the news today. Thanks, y'all. Back in 2017, 2018, I interviewed a few different authors, all good friends, all from different backgrounds and all game for my craziness. I'll probably pepper this podcast feed with a few of those interviews before I get back into doing new ones. Today's interview is from late 2017 or maybe early 2018, but it was released in 2018 as part of my two questions themed episodes of the original writing in suburbia. Why am I releasing this now? because the interview is with Nathan Ballingrud, the award-winning Nathan Ballingrud. Nathan is a writing genius, and he approaches horror and the macabre in such an original way. He subverts the genre and doesn't make it easy on the reader. You have to do a little thinking when you read Nathan's words. And now you have to do a little thinking when you watch Nathan's words, or at least the adaptations of his words. Nathan's novella, The Visible Filth, was turned into a movie called Wounds, and it is currently available on Hulu. But what's really cool is just a few days ago, more Nathan Ballingrood was released out into the wild. There is the brand new, and just in time for spooky season, horror anthology series on Hulu called Monsterland. The majority of the episodes are based on stories from Nathan's award-winning North American Lake Monsters short story collection. It's a brilliant book, and it's a brilliant series. Check them both out. The interview you are about to hear is pre-all this. It's a trip listening to the two of us chat before, well, before. I think you'll find it insightful and entertaining. I know I did when I listened to it again. So, kick back and get ready for a throwback to Nathan Ballingrude circa late 2017. Or early 2018? Hell if I know anymore. And of course, after the interview, you get to hear a word from our sponsor, which is me. I'm the sponsor. Oh, and a quick aside, if you hear random weird noises in this episode of the podcast, it's because honestly, I could not catch my cat and get him out of the room. Seriously, the little bugger was under everything, wedged himself into corners, places I could not reach without tearing the furniture apart. So, um... There's bonus cat noises sprinkled throughout this episode because, you know, writing at home, cats, that's what happens. But hey, that's how it is, right? No, yeah, don't forget to listen to, you know, the end after the interview, the sponsor stuff, whatever. Yeah, I'm the sponsor. Cool. All right, let's get to it. Hey, Nathan. (laughs) Welcome to the show. And uh, thanks for being on uh, two questions. And you know what they are. Why why do you write and what has been or still is the hardest part of being a writer? So let's let's dive right into those simple but not always easy to answer questions. Okay, yeah, they're not easy to answer. (laughs) Um, uh, Well, why do I write is, uh, it's probably an answer you hear a lot to these things. But uh, it's just, uh, I just love to do it. You know, it's, uh, it's just, it's a way of dealing with, um, some of my own inner turmoil. Sometimes it's a way of just having fun. Uh, it's just, it's a, uh, it's a kind of, it's a kind of productive escape. I get to get out of the real world, 
uh, and go into the world of the imagination. And, and at the same time, I'm kind of indulging myself. I feel like I'm doing something useful or at least at least worthwhile and that I'm making something, you know, so I don't it's not like playing a video game. <laughs> there That's you all. go productive escapism <laughs> mm -hmm. no i totally understand I'm, I'm i'm very similar in that um and you know your your, your answer is similar to uh, you know other interviews i've done but every everyone's always got their take i've had answers everything from i mean really it's it's full-on mental health therapy it's um how some folks you know really kind of keep themselves on that even keel um, by, you know, exorcising those demons uh, and just getting them out on the page. And um, others, kind of like myself, it, it's kind of compulsive. I, um, I'm a storyteller, <laughs> and if I don't yeah. write down my stories and put it into actual condoned fiction, uh, then it becomes uh, what some <coughs> people call uh, lies. Because <laughs> I just, right. you know, sometimes you just want to tell a story. And, and people are like, really? And I'm like, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> you got me it was sounded fun i'm gonna go write that down um have you always uh, how long have you been writing is this something you've been doing since you were a kid is it you know yep. so, yeah you start like yeah, ele elementary school or like how how young did you start probably if not elementary yeah well definitely elementary school yeah i used to write uh we used to read um you know whatever things they gave little kids to read and i would uh, go and write my own stories about those characters and uh, I remember one particular year, maybe it was a second or third grade, I showed it to my teacher and she was so charmed, she made me get up in front of class and read it, <laughs> which I was all too happy to do. And uh, I felt pretty important at the time, but looking back, it must have been, <laughs> it must have seemed like quite the uh, jackass to everyone else in the class. <laughs> but, um, but, but yeah, it was, so I've been doing it for as long as I can remember, uh, but I didn't really start doing it uh seriously probably until a little i started my in my 20s and probably not really until my 30s that i really kind of knuckled down and and and, and, and treat it like it's a like it's a job okay so i mean when when, when you did start approaching it that way um i mean where you, <coughs> you, you, you your intent was i mean definitely to get stories published um i mean how, how did yeah. you start out uh, short stories was that that because you definitely have you know you have the north american lake monsters uh collection uh but then you um you know you also have a novella out uh so yeah. you, are, have you been primarily focused on short stories to this point yes okay yeah uh, and that's how, that's how i started i started uh you know i in my 20s when i was in college i started reading uh you know, the, uh, the genre of fiction magazines like Asimov's and the magazine of fantasy and science fiction and Omni. Yep. And I wanted to get in there. So that's when I started submitting. Um, and uh, I sold one story to the magazine of fantasy and science fiction and something else to a small press called, a small uh, publication called The Silver Web. And uh, then I just stopped writing for a while. And uh, I guess, you know, unlike you, I'm not compulsive about it. It's... It, I, <laughs> I cannot do it and, and feel okay. And uh, more then than now, uh, okay. however. But, um, but yeah, when I got back into it in my 30s, I wanted to take it more seriously. Then I started, uh, again, with the short stories. And it's been pretty much exclusively short stories and then novellas until now. And now I'm, I'm writing a novel. Oh, okay. All right. And... So the transition into writing a novel has that is that because just the story itself that you have in your head is broader. It's it's gonna it needs to take up more than just the short space. Or are you just trying to flex that novel muscle that you know you you haven't really flexed before? Cause, I mean, I know a lot of writers are you know amazing short story writers and, and you're definitely one of them. Um, but some of them it's you know a novel's never not something they wanted to try. Um, is this, are you writing the novel? Basically, is it the burning story that it needs to be longer form or is it because you're like, Hey, I, I need to try this. I've, I've cut my teeth on the short stories and worked into novellas. Now time to go a little bigger. It's a little bit of both and okay. a little bit of, uh, practical considerations too. It's, um, in one sense, my, uh, the more I write, the more comfortable I am, uh, 
in a particular mode. And short stories and novels, of course, are completely different animals. Yes. As I know you, you, you know. Yeah. And people can be great short story writers and wretched novelists right. or, or vice versa. Um, and, and, and so part of it is this antis- artistic ambition. I want to, I want to try this other thing. You know, I want to, I want to do well in that area too. Part of it is because, especially over the last few years, the stories that I'm coming up with tend to be getting bigger in, uh, in concept. Okay. They require more space, more time to, to develop character. And, uh, and partly it's practical, you know, you can't make a whole lot of money writing short stories. And, um, it's not like in a pulp era where you could scratch out a living if you worked fast enough. Um, right. And I would, I would like to make a little more money. You know, I'd like to take a shot at a bigger paycheck. Yeah. Um, so it would be it would be disingenuous to pretend that that's not also a consideration. But uh, but mostly it's the the ideas are just needing more space, and that's why the stories are just getting longer and longer. Uh, and the book that I have coming out uh, early next year, um, a couple of them are, are novellas in there. Okay. Excellent. Um, so I guess g- getting on to the second question, we've had a few few tangential questions in between, but the That's second good. big one, what has been or still is the hardest part of being a writer? Um, <laughs> and I'm sure it's a many layered answer. I, I have yet to have an inter- interviewee just go, blah, this. But hey, go for it. If, if you can just give us a... The, the three word sentence, uh, you know, the answer to it all, that that would be a revelation. But I have a feeling there's uh, a little more. I can't. <laughs> I can't because I have such mixed feelings about these this, this question. On that because on the one hand, there are, I think, a couple things that are difficult about it. Yeah. And on the other hand, my in, my my instinctive reaction when I hear writers talk about how hard their, their job is, I kind of cringe. <laughs> um, it's, there's this there's this sense of romanticizing uh, the work, which has always been kind of gross to me, and uh, it's to me it's just work. You just sit down and you do the work like you do any other work. Um, that being said, uh, the uh, was there are a couple things that are difficult about it to me, and it's not always the same thing. Um, sometimes it's sometimes I struggle with discipline. You know, I have a hard time making myself sit down and force words out when I don't know what it is I want to write, when I don't know what's going to happen next, when I'm not hearing the character's voice. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult sometimes to sit down and make myself write anyway. Um, that's a weakness that I have. Um, and uh, that's probably the, the big one for me. The... Um, and a lot of it is, especially when I'm moving, when I'm writing, when I'm writing character pieces, it's not quite as difficult. But when I'm writing things that require more plot elements, right. which I'm trying to do lately, it's a thing, you know, it's, I didn't do a lot of that in the first book. And I'm trying to, it's another muscle I'm trying to develop going forward. And so I'm trying to do more of that in, in, the, in the next book. And, uh, and that was challenging. That's a challenging thing to learn. I think. Perhaps that comes naturally to some folks, but it did not to me. And um, just just making the 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 engine of the story work right. uh, is was a in a plot way rather than a character way was was tough for me. Yeah, no, I understand that. I mean, I, I'm fairly pro- prolific. <laughs> I write a lot of novels. Um, character for me is is not hard. Uh, dialogue for me definitely not hard in fact i mean that's where i live i live in the characters and them talking and spe- just you know interacting with each other and the world yeah. around them um me building too. a plot around that <laughs> is you know i could you know pretty pretty much you you could say my general inclination is every novel starts off as my dinner with andre um <laughs> <laughs> And it's like, oh no, now I got to actually make this into something with substance and structure other than yeah. just characters chatting with each other. It yeah, surprised me because, yeah. because you're so prolific. I would have thought that that came much more naturally to you, that it, that, that, that that was just maybe almost second nature to you. It's It's kind of encouraging for me. To hear you say that. Yeah, no, it is. It isn't second nature. And I usually my my number one philosophy in um, how I write a novel fast is 
uh, even when I realize there's a plot issue, I just jot a mm -hmm. note down and then keep finishing it because, it, and it, you know, this phrase comes from the film industry. I can fix it in post. Um, right, right. <laughs> I may not actually know the plot until the end of the novel. And then I'm like, oh, this is how I tie it all together. Then I that's go back and put in the elements and change the elements so that that plot makes sense. And yeah, it looks like it's been there from the beginning. Um, but no, I, I honestly, the plot, you know, with writing itself, the plot is the hardest part for me um, because I really, I, those, those characters just kind of want to, I just channel them and they just jabber and act and go through the world. Um, and then, yeah, trying <laughs> to make a cohesive, uh, you know, picture out of it all. That's, that's always been the trick. So that's a, uh, that, yeah, that's I, my, my approach is actually very similar. Uh, when I can't find my way into a story, sometimes I will just write conversations that the character's having and yeah. uh, just, just listen to them talk. Uh, and, and sometimes that's how I get to know who they are. And I'll, and those conversations rarely make it into the story. Right. But, but it's like, you know, it's like overhearing them and you get to know them that way. And the, uh, the last story, that I, well, the story I just finished, which is a uh, which was a novella. Um, I didn't know. This sounds ridiculous, but you know, like you just said, I didn't really know what the what the core idea, what the plot was supposed to be aiming toward until I was writing the last third of the thing, and then it kind of dawned on me. I was able to write the end, but then I had to go back and do some heavy work, yep. realigning everything. Yeah, exactly. No, I'm pretty. I'm pretty much the same way. I'm actually uh, neck deep in edits. Um, I got back from a publisher, uh, so I got all the story edits back, and um, my <laughs> my troubles with plot <laughs> are pointed out <laughs> by someone else. You know, not all of my my novels I put out have you know a story editor. A lot of times, you know, it's very guerrilla, and um, yeah. I have a proofreader that handles it. You know, or the the edit the publisher has a proofreader that you know takes care of all the, the grammar issues and whatnot, but um, right. it's up to me to fix that plot. So when I, when I got this manuscript back, I was like, oh, I got some heavy lifting to do here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there's, there's certain things, though, that, you know, it, it's, it's kind of interesting working with the story editor. There's like, okay, I, I see the point of that note, but at the same time, I'm going to be able to, I'm going to disregard it because yes, I am not completely revealing the plot. I'm not, yes, it's, there's, there's some murky area there, but in a way that's also sort of my voice is leaving that little bit, uh, leaving the reader kind of off kilter um, a little bit and um, as clueless as the characters. I don't, I'm not one of those writers that likes to foreshadow a lot. I'm not one of those writers, uh, even when I know exactly what the plot is going to be, I don't like to, um, you know, open the windows too soon, which um, yeah. bugs some editors I've noticed. <laughs> yeah. But hey, you know, the, 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 as long as the end result is uh, get a good story out to the reader, that's, that's kind of the whole thing. Um, so now, you know, other than, than the hard part of writing of the craft itself, what, what for you, just being a writer, the profession of the business of the, the stuff you deal with outside of the typing and the story, what's the hardest part about that for you? What, you know, I mean, or hardest parts, <laughs> uh, timing, finding time and, yep. and, 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 and carving out blocks of time that I can regularly adhere to. Uh, that's, that's yeah. always been a challenge for me. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a single parent, uh, still work a regular day job. Okay. And, and balancing the obligations, the day job is, is, it's not one of those that you have to take home. So that's right. fine. That's just, that's just time. Uh, balancing out the obligations of, of being a responsible parent, and, uh, and, well, and, 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 and making time for myself to do this is, uh, has been, has been tougher. It's easier now that my daughter is older. Mm -hmm. Uh, she needs me and wants me around less than she used to do. <laughs> but, <laughs> but for a long time, that was tough. Yeah. No, I, 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 I get that. I, you know, I write full time. 
Um, so I'm, I'm able to have the day to myself other than the dogs. Um, <laughs> and they don't usually get in the way they can, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I, so I'm, I'm able to carve out that time because that's, that's, that's my day. That's my nine to five. Uh, it instantly all falls apart during, uh, school breaks, uh, yep. Christmas break, uh, summer break and all that when, you know, cause my wife's a teacher, so she has the break off too. So the whole family's here. And even though they don't necessarily need me around and even though everyone's doing their own thing, they're in the house that, that presence, um, yes. it, trying to block that out. Even if I shut the doors to the office, they're still out there. I mean, you know, that's part of family and all of that. You're connected. And so, um, you feel the gravity. yeah, yeah, exactly. I think part of it is the anticipation waiting for the interruption. <laughs> mm -hmm. I try, I try to block it out and just focus on the writing, focus on the writing, <coughs> but I know the interruptions coming at some point point. <laughs> yep. and uh, I'm not going to go all shining and, you know, get off <laughs> freaking dish. when I am doing this, you aren't in my space. Not going to get all crazy like that. But um, right. it, it, it creates a, a hesitation, I've noticed that for me, of getting started. I mean, like you said, it, it, you know, just the sitting down, the discipline of writing, um, the sitting down and putting your butt in the chair and actually doing it and doing the work can be hard in of itself. And then you have that little voice going, they're going to knock on the door. They're going to knock on the door. Yeah, it's it's very much the same thing. It's It's like you need to... I don't I mean, I'm sure there are writers to whom this does not apply, but in my case, I need a certain level of like uh, uh, mental real estate in, in order to. And but part of that is is prolonged isolation and prolonged silence. Right. Uh, and even even when, you know, my daughter's in the in the in the house and I, I, I love her to death. But right. yeah, like it's like you say, it's just the presence of other people. Sometimes will just be enough turbulence that uh, that it's hard to achieve that that silence, yeah. and it's hard to sink down into the place where you need to sink. Um, just because there's just these little tremors of activity all around you, and it just sounds so precious to say that, and I <laughs> and I kind of cringe at hearing myself say it, but but it happens to be true. Yeah, at least in my case. Well, I, I know with me, even even without worrying about the interruptions, um, just having that other presence around influences, you know, the my conscious mind and subconscious mind, um, yep. and even little sounds that are out there that aren't part of my normal work day. You know, when everyone's home, I, I'll be typing away and hear something, and it may not really interrupt anything, and I'm still typing along, but whatever it was, a word, a phrase, a noise, something starts working into my subconscious and pretty soon uh, productivity starts to slow. And I'm like, what, what was that? What, what, you know, I mean, we invent, you know, something from nothing as writers, <laughs> and which means we have influences. We, we have, I don't want to say, you know, necessarily the muse, but there are definitely things that spark these reasons that we're writing these stories and all of that, yeah. which I have a feeling that, you know, writers brains tend to be more susceptible, you know, even on a subconscious level of outside stimuli. And pretty soon that little, that little worm starts wiggling its way <laughs> in there and, you know, creates its own little story. It's little subtext of what could be going on out there. What's happening there. So for, for me, that, that, my day-to-day -day job of writing is, is, isn't so hard. It's, it's the, yeah. When, when there's the other stuff, when there are the distractions. So, um, I can only imagine. Yeah. yeah. Oh, go on. Yeah. It's the same with you now, but I also, I also feel guilty, you know, if, uh, yeah. I'm not by myself in the house, in the apartment and, uh, and, uh, you know, my kids in the other room or in the living room doing whatever she's doing. Um, and if she's here and I'm also here, you know, clacking away, but I start to feel like, you know, selfish. Yeah. Like, you know, put down the computer, engage with your kid, go out and do something. Yep. Uh, you know, whatever. But I just I feel I feel like it's uh, I feel like I'm I'm putting walls up around myself, and and I and I'm being uh, exclusionary, and right. I don't want to be that way. And she may not feel that way at all. She may be quite content doing whatever she's doing, but but you know, in my own mind. 
I'm doing something well. Yep, exactly. Had the same thing with my son back from college for this last Christmas break. I was like, you know, I, sh I should really be spending time with him. I should, you know, be picking his brain, seeing how things are going, doing all that. So that was always there when I was like, okay, I need to be sitting down and writing. But then I also need to be interacting <laughs> with with my, my child who is in a major yeah. transition part of his life. And, you know, the reality was that, you know, we, we would chat for five minutes and then he'd be like, hey, can I have the truck? I'm going to go meet friends because <laughs> he, he's in full on college social mode. So he, his brain isn't feeling that that need to interact with dad as much as exactly. my brain was feeling the need to interact with son. Uh, so, yeah, that guilt is is definitely there. Um, we probably pile it on a little thicker than our kids <laughs> actually need think want <laughs> especially now that the teenagers yeah, yeah. i'm sure, i have no doubt that's true yeah definitely um all right well cool that's 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 some great stuff there um oh okay nope i got i got one more and i meant to ask you this and luckily yep. i actually made a note here and this goes perfectly <laughs> with the whole uh solitude and you know that real estate of science silence um, mm -hmm. did I see, I saw on, um, I believe Facebook that, uh, you actually like you secluded yourself. Did you not, you went, um, did a little, did a little writing away from home and, and yeah, all of it was, that. It was one of those writer's retreat things, which okay. I've never been on. This is my first, first time going on one of these things. Um, and I felt a little weird about it, um, at first just because it was a new thing yeah. and it seemed, I don't know, it's. There's a part of me that, that just is suspicious of that kind of stuff. It's like, you know, it's like anything that kind of anything that kind of like makes the idea of writing like seem at all precious or different uh, <laughs> than anything else just makes me suspicious and, and leery. Right. But um but I did it anyway and I had a it was great, you know. It was a uh, I went to this place in uh, Tennessee. It was uh, a a week uh Okay. Uh, several others were there, and also other artisans, like uh, like uh, people working in uh, in physical arts, like clay, and pottery, things like that. Oh, okay. Wood, and uh, and I got a lot of work done. It was it was nice to be able to think about nothing but but doing the work. You know, there was no aside from one reading during the week. There was no uh, no obligation at all, um, and it was it was nice. It was it was that real estate of silence. It was just in a room just doing the work for uh, six days. And I finished my manuscript at last. It was late, but I finally got it done there, sent it in, so that felt terrific. Nice. Uh, yeah, I'd do it again. I would still feel weird about it, uh, but, <laughs> but I'd do it again because it was so useful. Okay, that's what I, that's, and that was the big thing I want to know. Is it, 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 was it useful? Is it something you do again? I've never done a writer's retreat. Um, I don't know because you know i mean basically i i write full time so my my, my days are a little retreat there right. but um but i've always wondered you know because I, my fear has always been they devolve into socialization um and you mm -hmm. know we're writers artists creators we tend to be solitary kind of as it is. So that's always been my fear of doing, you know, going like, yeah, this, this would be cool. Do a writer's retreat, kind of be around surrounded by other people creating and doing that. But then will it fall into everyone wanting to talk about <laughs> creating and how much work gets done? So it's, it's good to hear that, um, you, you got, you got your real estate of silence. You got your t time, you know, in, you were able to finish that manuscript and you're actually, you know, despite of how weird you feel about it, you're thinking of doing it again. Um, for people listening, I think that's that's going to be helpful. Because um, honestly, I haven't talked to a lot of people who've done writers retreats, uh, other than people who are like brand, brand, brand new at writing, and right. haven't done really, haven't published anything, haven't you know, they're they're hoping that's the creative spark. But someone like you who has years of experience, it's a good perspective to get, definitely. And, and those those risks that you mentioned though are are risks. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing can happen. It didn't happen to this one. Okay. Like I say, it's one I've been to, so I don't know if it's typical or not. But um, but there was a there was a kind of a communal area, and at night we would all kind of collect there and talk for a little while. Uh, because there were other aspects of the of this place, like, like people doing woodwork, people making making 
spots or what have you, some of the writers would spend a lot of time during the day kind of circulating around those other workshops and just kind of watching and taking in their, the other process he's going on. Okay. Um, I'm sure they got a lot out of that. They, they said that they did. I didn't do any of that. I just, uh, I was very, very much the hermit and uh, just locked myself down. Um, so I think those risks are there. You have to be, you still have to bring some level of self-control, but it's, it's easier because there are so many, there's so much, so much less going on around you. Right. To just... Okay. Awesome. Well, that is perfect. That is good to know. Well, I think we definitely nailed those, uh, two questions. Um, and you know, thanks for giving your, your opinions, your answers, your insight, uh, on, on those, uh, Nathan, where can people find you when they want to, when they want to go looking? <laughs> um, I'm pretty easy to find online. I've got uh, a website, which is just my name.com. Okay. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. Uh, if you just check, you just type in Bowling Groot, you'll find me. All right. Perfect. And I will put all that in the show notes so everyone uh, can click on that automatically. Um, is there an, anything, any works, what, what you, you know, what, what do you have coming out? When is it coming out? Um, what's, what's your, what's your future looking like here? The, uh, the next short story that's coming out is called Jasper Dodd's Matt, Jasper Dodd's Handbook of Spirits and Manifestations. Okay. That's coming out in a book of ghost stories edited by Ellen Datlow. I believe this will be coming out later this year. Okay. Uh, my next book is coming out most likely early 2019. Or wait, no, wait. Is today 20, it's 2018 now, right? It's 2018 now, yes. <laughs> early next year is when it should be coming out. It's called okay. The Atlas of Hell. It's another collection of uh, short stories um, and it'll be coming out from Small Beer Press. And uh, beyond that, I'm working on a novel. So hopefully that will be out. Hopefully I'll be finished with that you know, by the end of the year. Perfect. All right. And for everyone who hasn't checked out North American Lake Monsters, please do. That's I absolutely love the stories in there. Um, and they and they run the gamut of, of, of genres and tones. There's, you know, there's a little something for everybody in there. Absolutely love them. Uh, Nathan, thanks for being on. I truly appreciate it. Um, having me. And, you know, good luck with the novel and everything else. Thank you very much. All right. Talk to you Same later. To you. Right. Bye bye. Hey, all you crazy folks out there. Do you like zombies? Do you like mechs? Do you like post apocalyptic wastelands filled with cults and cannibals and city states and hundreds of thousands of the undead? Then you're gonna love Dead Mech. In the far, far future, Dead Mech asks the question What happens when a mech pilot dies while piloting their 50 foot battle robot and then becomes a zombie? You get a Dead Mech! Dead Mech is available for free as an ebook, and you can find the link at jakebible.com. Want to listen for free? Then check out the re release of the original podcast version of the novel. Subscribe for free at jakebible.substack.com and you'll get an episode each week delivered right to the podcast player of your choice. Hell, you may have already noticed an episode or two in this very feed. Don't want to wait each week? Then feel free to either become a paid subscriber at jakebible.substack.com and get all of the episodes at once, or go to jakebible.com and purchase the audiobook from the web store or buy it from one of those giganto mega corporations. They have copies waiting for you too. Remember, head to jakebible.com or jakebible.substack.com. You're gonna love it. We were so young, sigh. I can't even begin to list everything that has happened to us as writers and has happened to the world as a whole since that episode was first released. Not the same world anymore, that's for sure. But I think the themes that Nathan and I talked about and the themes in each episode of Monsterland still resonate today. Or I hope they do. I'll let you all decide that. Hey, thanks for listening. I truly appreciate you taking this ride with me. Seriously, y'all rock. I'll talk to you next week. Oh, and something to always remember, and I think today's throwback interview has proved it. You can only fail if you quit. 
Life, writing, everything is a long game. So keep at it. Cheers, y'all. Writing in Suburbia with Jake Bible is a Jake Bible Fiction LLC production, all rights reserved. All music is by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Kevin has been a huge part of the podcast community for well over a decade now. So check him out and drop him some coin if you get a chance. Full credits are in the show notes. For all links to works and stuffs mentioned in the episode, please check out the show notes or head over to jakebible.substack.com. Thank you for listening. Cheers, y'all.